I was aware of the power of Kubrick as a director when I first saw, for the first time, Dr. Strangelove, which was when I was standing in line uh, in San Jose. I was in high school. We lived, I was, I was in my last year of high school, as a matter of fact. And uh, I was standing in a very long line when my father jumped out of a car. He had found me in line. It was a rainy day in San Jose. He ran over to me with a letter from the Selective Service. That's our version of when you're drafted into the Army and handed me this letter and waited until I opened it. I opened it and it basically said, you must report for your army physical. And, and that's when I kind of became aware that my life could be over in a year. And my dad was completely aware of that. And my dad said, let's go home. And I said, no, I want to watch the film. Uh, so I st stood there in line alone with this letter. And I went into the theater and Strange Love began. And I had the letter in my back pocket. And when Strange Love was finished and I left the theater, and I stood on the curb waiting for my father to pick me up. I had totally forgotten that I had a letter threatening to draft me into the United States Armed Services. And that's when I first became aware of the power of Stanley Kubrick. It was a very bizarre film to see with a draft letter in your back pocket, though, wasn't it? It was for the first 45 minutes of that picture. I was completely haunted by the juxtapositioning of, of the threat of an end to the world and the threat to, you know, you know the, the threat on the end of my life, and 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 but but the ethers of that picture so caught me up, and I so got into the black comedy and into, into George C. Scott's character, and all the great Peter Sellers performances that it really, utterly made me forget, you know, that I had to perhaps be facing the same conflict someday. I'm wondering. You mentioned black comedy, and certainly as a kid, that's what I responded to, and I'm wondering if. Kids are as cynical as old, old people, more cynical, I think. And maybe that is one facet of Kubrick's great ability to bring out the black comedy that, that appeals to a younger audience, do you think? Well, you know, I think Kubrick has done that with many of his films. You know, he has, uh, you know, I always thought he, he was a very wry guy and, and a very dry wry guy and had a way of getting his message across uh, by making it even more painful, by making you defensively almost to protect oneself, you know, laugh at the antics on the screen at the same time you were utterly chilled to the bone, that what you were really laughing about was you were whistling as you passed the cemetery. And I think Stanley so often whistled as he walked past the graveyard. The first time I saw uh, 2001, I believe it was in Hollywood, the Pantages Theater, and I was a uh, student at Cal State Long Beach. And I had gone in, in, in a car with my friends to see Strange Love, I mean, to see 2001, and, and we were stuck in line. We were stuck in the ticket line, and we got to the point where we got to the booth and the show had been sold out, so we had to buy tickets for the next show. So we basically waited in line for three plus hours until the crowd let out and they cleaned up the theater, and then we got in there. So our anticipation, by the time we found our seats was basically to the threshold of beyond. I mean, I was ready even before Stargate. I was Stargate at that point. I was so desperate to see that picture. And of course, I was desperate to see the picture because it was Stanley Kubrick, and a lot of my friends had seen it before me. And the entire campus was talking about Strange, uh, talking about 2001. They were talking about the, you know, the, the fact that it was, it was a drug movie. Now, that was kind of strange for me because I never took any drugs. And so, never having experimented with anything. I didn't understand why they kept calling it a drug movie. And, and they were saying, well, the idea is you take drugs and then you go to the movie. And it just heightens the experience. The drugs that you've taken heighten the experience of the film. But I came out the other end of that picture. I know, personally speaking, much higher than any of my friends who had taken, you know, you know, you know, you know mind-altering substances. I went in there, you know, clean as a whistle. And I came out of there altered myself. That film was the drug. He took you into space for the first time. I mean, since 2001, no documentary, no other movie, um, no IMAX experience being on the shuttle and looking down at Earth has ever really put me in space as much as 2001 did. It made me fear it and made me want it so desperately want to be part of that great mystery, want, want to be at the forefront of the pioneers that would discover, you know, the monolith and Stargate and what lies beyond. So 
I mean, my God, that was maybe for me his most realistic movie that he had ever made. And I think his second most realistic movie that he ever made for me was was um, Clockwork Orange. Clockwork Orange is a depiction of, 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 of grotesque violence, but it also has utter contempt for violence. And, and when you put on Singing in the Rain during that sequence where he's kicking that person to death, it is utterly contemptuous. And it is almost like saying, why isn't somebody doing something about this? Where's the world when these acts of man against man are happening all over the world, you know, every 30 seconds? You know, you know where's justice? Where's order? You know, you know, why do we allow this chaos to happen? And of course, the great morality play that is Clockwork Orange is that after all of this, you know, you know, deprogramming and, uh, and, uh, and a kind of proselytizing of the Malcolm McDowell character through science and theory, he comes out the other end more charming, more witty, and with such a devilish wink and blink at the audience that I am completely certain that when he gets out of that hospital, he's going to kill his mother and his father and his partners and his friends, and he's going to be worse than he was when he went in. And so in a sense, I've always felt that Clockwork Orange was Stanley's most defeatist movie. The film where he appears to totally give up on society. And the film that maybe justifies why he lives in St. Albans in the safety of the British countryside. Because he was afraid of that. I'll tell you a quick story. When we first met, which was 1980, when he was just finishing the construction of his sets for The Shining, and we met for the first time. Um, we talked a lot about movies, and I was about to make Raiders of the Lost Ark, and I was actually moving on to his stages. When he finished, I was moving in. And, of course, when his stage burned down, it changed my schedule. We had to go to France first to start shooting to give Stanley a chance to finish Strike and let us build the Well of the Souls where the Overlook main hotel you know, lobby was, the, the main room where... Jack Nicholson did the, the infamous typing. Um, when it was all over and the movie was done, I saw Stanley again and went to his house for dinner in London and in, in, in St. Albans. And, and he asked me uh, quite, you know, he said, how did you like my movie? And I only seen it once, and I didn't love Shining the first time I saw it. I have since seen Shining 25 times, one of my favorite pictures. Kubrick films tend to grow on you. You have to see them more than once, but the wild thing is... It, it, I defy you to name me one Kubrick film that you can turn off once you start it. It's impossible. He's got this fail-safe button or something. It's impossible to turn off a Kubrick film. But I didn't like it the first time I saw it. And, and, and I, I, to, I, I, was, I was telling him all the things I liked about it, and he saw right through me. And he said, well, well Stephen, obviously you didn't like my picture very much. And I said, well, there's a lot of things I loved about it. He says, yeah, but there's a lot of things you didn't, probably more you didn't than you didn't, so tell me what you didn't like about it. And I said, well... The thing that I, I thought Jack Nicholson, who was a great actor, I thought it was a great performance, but it was almost a great kabuki performance. It was almost like kabuki theater. He said, you mean you think Jack went over the top? And I said, yeah, I, I, I kind of I kind of did. And he said, okay, quickly without thinking, who are your top favorite actors of all time? And I want you to think, just name off some names. So I quickly, you know, went Spencer Tracy, you know, Henry Fonda, Jimmy Stewart, you know, Cary Grant, Clark Gable. He said, stop. He stopped me. He said, okay, where was James Cagney on that list? And I didn't have, I, I thought, well, he's, he's up there high. He, I, so I said, ah, oh, but he's not in the top five. He said, you don't consider James Cagney one of the five best actors around. You see, I do. This is why Jack Nicholson's performance is a great one. I really wanted to be scared by it, number one. I wanted to be frightened by it in a kind of carnival Fear. I wanted things to pop out at me. I wanted to jump out of my seat. I wanted shocks. I wasn't expecting a psychological shock storm. I was hoping for a kind of visceral, visual assault on all of my senses. And instead it was about the descent into madness. And he very inexorably pulled the entire audience down with him. So at that moment, where, you know, you know, you know, Shelley is reading 
the last three months of what he has been writing and we see the litany of what he has written you know you know all work no play make jack a dull boy um that is the biggest shock of the shining and that is the greatest genius of the shining that he could so traumatize us sh slowly but surely with this with these images and 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 this dread just waiting for you around the corner when you're dolling behind a child on a tricycle um that you would be shocked by that you know th that was the equivalent of the chair turning around the psycho and the sudden reveal of mrs bates and it's more shocking than the sudden reveal of mrs bates if you get into the protoplasm of that movie if you give yourself over to it you'll be more shocked by what he's written over the last four months at one point i heard a story that he phoned Stephen King in the middle of the night in Maine and asked Stephen, I guess he had been working on the screenplay for a while, Stanley had, and he asked Stephen, do you believe in God? And Stephen said, yes, I do. And Stanley said, that's what I thought, and Stanley hung up the telephone. And that might have been the time that Stanley, Stanley took over the project himself and had, and, and, and had decided which direction he was going to take the movie. Now, I asked Stanley that same question. I said, did you ever call Stephen King at 3 o'clock in the morning and say, do you believe in God? And they said, not to my knowledge. So Stanley denies that he ever ever did that. But that's just one of those apocryphal, perhaps apocryphal stories that's out there in the world. That if if it's certainly not true, it, it still provides a little bit of insight into Stanley's choices and his, his approach to that specific piece of material. The great thing about Stanley was he was totally complimentary. He loved pictures. He would call a completely unknown American director on the telephone. And he'd say, hi, it's Stanley Kubrick. I love your picture. And he'd want to talk to you about it. And he shocked people. I'm sure several people hung up on Stanley thinking it was a crank call. But Stanley um, loved movies and would not spare the compliments. He would just he, he, he would just throw all these. And from Kubrick, to hear good things about a picture you made was the greatest gift anybody could possibly give you. Stanley just loved all the new toys that were coming available every couple of months. and. Uh, and I kind of supplied him with a lot of toys. I was sort of his uh, toy broker. You know, I'd get the Sharper Image catalog, and I'd, I'd call Stanley up, and I'd say, this is a great new cell phone I just saw on Sharper Image. And he'd say, send me the catalog. And, and I'd send him the phone instead. <laughs> and, and it was because the, the, the funny thing was, whenever I would see Stanley, you know, all the sort of the toys of our trade were always in, in, in shambles, but they were always all over Stanley's kitchen, in his workspace, everywhere in his in his sort of farmhouse there were uh, different uh, kind of uh, series series toys there was the the old you know, cell phone that was this big and then, and then and then there was another one that was this big and one that was this big and the one that was this it kept getting smaller and smaller Stanley kept them all he never threw anything away every phone conversation was just in, an inspiration for me personally um, Stanley liked information. I supplied him with a lot of information. Sometimes information he asked me for, other information I volunteered for. In getting to know him, I understood what the, what the dynamic of the relationship was. That St Stanley would give me advice. He'd collaborate with me. I'd tell him a story I was interested in directing as a movie. And he'd ask me all the tough questions. What do you find interesting about that story? Why do you want to make that picture? Gee, that sounds kind of boring to me. How can you make that interesting? I mean, he was challenging me constantly. He gave me as much, if not more, than I feel I ever, ever could possibly give him. First, he gave me all his movies, and then he gave me his friendship, which meant he gave me his time. And there's no greater gift a person can give to another person. I think Stanley's biggest problem was he loved making movies so much he didn't want to stop making them. And I think Stanley was always waiting for that one take that would be the breakthrough take, where the actors would surprise him and blow him away with things that he couldn't even think of. And maybe that's one of the reasons they kept pushing for more takes. But um, I always wanted to watch him work and never had a chance to. And, uh, and was too afraid to ask him, could I come visit you on the set of Eyes Wide Shut? I was shooting Saving Private Ryan the same time he was shooting Eyes Wide Shut. And we were in the same country. And we were in the same city. And I invited him to my set once a week. But he never invited me to his set. And I was too af afraid, afraid to oppose myself and ask him. Because I didn't want him to say no. When he saw Schindler's List, you know, he was very interested in talking to me about technique and craft.
we talked a little bit of theory and philosophy and a little bit about the Holocaust, but we mainly talked about the craft of the film, which he wanted to know about the handheld camera. And I told him, he said, well, who influenced you to handle the camera like that? Where did you get that idea? Gee, did you get that from the Battle of, for Algiers? Or uh, did you get that from, um, I said, I got that from documentaries shot by the Signal Corps, real World War II documentaries, and from you. He said, what do you mean from me? I said, well, don't you remember the sequence when they were trying to retake Burpleson Air Force Base? And you shot that tremendous cinema very taste scene with long lenses and handheld cameras with the people shooting at the air base and the squibs going off against, uh, you know, against, uh, you know, Sterling Hayden's window and, and all of that. And it was all done handheld style. I said, yeah. I said, well, it was the Signal Corps cameraman and you that influenced me on how to tell the story that way and then later on how to do Saving Private Ryan. And he was not very good at take, taking compliments. He goes, gee, thanks, and he changed the subject. <laughs> when you look at all of his films, even though they all have one thing in common, for me anyway, the craft is impeccable. Every film he's ever made, the craft is impeccable. The lighting, the dolly shots, the crane moves, the zoom-ins on Barry Lyndon, the framing, the lighting, the hot windows as backlight, you know, you know there's the compositions. I mean, the exact compositions. You had to hit your mark precisely to please Stanley so he'd get his painting, the painting he was putting on canvas for you to appreciate it, it had to be perfect. Uh, the, his choice of lenses, his steady cam work in, 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 in latter year films, impeccable, the best in history. Nobody could shoot a movie better than Stanley Kubrick in history. Um, that was impeccable, but the way he told stories was sometimes antithetical to the way we are accustomed to receiving stories. And I think sometimes Stanley just did that because he didn't want to be like everybody else and he had a very specific way of telling a story. It's not that he wanted to show off, I'm so different than you, but he said, why does every story have to be told the same way? He would tell me the last couple of years of his life when we were talking about the form, he kept saying, I want to change the form. I want to make a movie that changes the form. And I said, well, didn't you do that with 2001? He said, just a little bit but not enough. I really want to change the form. So he kept looking for different ways to tell stories. Well, I think the first thing that made Stanley Kubrick so special was he was a chameleon. He, he never made the same picture twice. Every single picture is a different genre, a different period, a different story, a different risk. The only thing that Bond in all of his films was the incredible virtuoso that he was with craft and with editing and with performance and with camera placement, with composition. But every single story was different. And every single story somehow was so mysterious in the way the story was told, so kept you guessing, how's this gonna turn out? What's gonna happen next? I can't even imagine. And all those films are so filled with hairpin turns and story surprises and character surprises that you must see his films more than once because you yearn for those same surprises. And the genius of Stanley is you can look at a movie of his 15 times and even though you know it's right around the corner, you'll still give up, give it up, and you'll be, you'll be surprised all over again. And I don't know anybody else who possesses that kind of magic. Stanley predicted that the internet was going to be the next generation of filmmaking filmmaking and filmmakers and when I woke up on Sunday morning I do what I do every day I go out I click on to America online and I get my headlines and I clicked on America online on Sunday morning and it said Kubrick dead at 70 and um, and it was only days later that the irony that that's how I would discover that Stanley had moved on was going to come from the technology that Stanley sort of both with giddiness and excitement and also with profound caution told me was going to be the next generation that might change the form of cinema. And that's how I discovered he had died. And then 25 minutes later, Nicole Kidman called me from New York and told me in person. Was it something, uh, you know, we who didn't know him had the feeling that he was in a sense immortal was that your feeling as well? Oh, yeah. I thought he would live, I, I thought he would outlive uh, Kurosawa. I thought he would make his ran at 80. 
and um, and it was it was it was it was very hard to believe. I uh, uh, my wife came in to the room, and we were going to go shopping. We were going to do grocery shopping on Sunday, and she said, "Do you want to go shopping?" And I said, "Read this," and she read it, and she got tears in her eyes. But I didn't have any tears in my eyes because I didn't believe that Sunday was dead, because I didn't believe that that infernal piece of technology was going to tell me that this filmmaker and my friend was not with me anymore. I wasn't going to believe that. I wasn't going to take that from that. I would take it from a person, but not from that machine. And so I went shopping, and it hit me in the grocery store that, that, that it was probably true. And then 25 minutes later, when the phone rang, when I got back, and Nikki was on the phone, and she was destroyed, then I, then I, then I lost it. And then Tom called me 15 minutes after I hung with Nikki, and Tom was devastated, and, and then we were just all devastated together. And then the, all the calls began coming in. And then I knew it was true. He'll be remembered, you know, as the man who made these 13 pictures. I mean, that's how he'll be remembered. He'll be remembered through his films, and he'll constantly be remembered every time we look at one of them. And he'll inspire a whole new generation of filmgoers still too young to see his pictures. But when they're old enough and they do get a chance to see him, they'll be inspired to tell good stories and to tell, you know, somewhat elliptical stories that are more compelling than the linear form, perhaps. And maybe he'll influence a lot of kids not to come out of the same hole, you know, twice. Maybe, maybe, maybe he'll really inspire us all to be different every time we do something and to try to reinvent ourselves every time we have the, that opportunity which is what I think he did. His films will certainly be classics. Everything he, he, he does is an instant classic, even the films that aren't as popular, aren't as well-loved by the, by the critics and by the general, you know, you know uh, powers to be that talk and write about film. Uh, there's not a film in his body of work that hasn't become a classic of sorts. And, and I'm just sorry that the body of work was, you know, you know um, so small. But when you really look at all his movies, he probably had the greatest vertical penetration, emotionally and profoundly, of any of us put together. I'm not sure Sonny even would have wanted a funeral, but um, I think one of the, a couple of things that were out of Stanley's control, I think we all suddenly found that because Stanley was so totally in control of every aspect of his films and probably his life, Certainly of his friends, he was totally in control of me. Um, um, th these were a few of the occasions where Stanley wouldn't have Final Cut. And, uh, and, and not having that Final Cut was a benefit to his friends. It was a gift to all of us. Because we all got to, you know, say our piece and, uh, and hope he, he was listening. The thing that I returned to again and again in my mind was the film that I, I elected to show my friends on the Sunday Stanley died, the Sunday America time Stanley died, when I, when I got the news. And some people came over to the house that night that they were scheduled to come over for dinner anyway. And we talked the whole night about Stanley. And I wanted to show all of them a scene from a movie that for me represented how deep Stanley's heart was and how much he could love and how much he could show emotion because he had been so often criticized for not being an emotional director. I thought he was a very emotional director. And so I put on the last scene from Paz of Glory where Christiana, who he then married, who plays the German captive girl, stands up in front of all the French soldiers and sings that song and brings down the house in tears. And we were all crying. As the soldiers were crying, we were crying watching just the last scene, didn't show them the whole picture. And that isolated last scene so hit a chord with everyone in the room, and two people that night had never seen Paths of Glory, but were still totally affected by that sequence. And that, to me, represented who Stanley was as a human being. <laughs>